There's a story in the Bible about a woman, a very simple housewife, who suddenly is caught up in a terrible situation in which she has to kill, by a terrible means, the general of an enemy army. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, my name is Father Mike Manning. God bless you. Thank you very much for tuning into this program. You are going to be deeply blessed by this program. We've got a powerhouse experience. What we're doing is we're going through some of the women of the Hebrew Bible, women that have experienced God in their life, and we're bringing those stories out, telling the stories, but then getting a chance to be able to see how that story can relate to us today. And isn't that what the Bible is about? The Bible is really the story of a bunch of people who run into God, and God is able to change their lives. And you and I, as we read, as we hear the story, suddenly have that, that experience kind of vibrating into our life, and that touches us, and we can understand how God is calling us, just as he called these men and these women of the Hebrew Bible and of all the Bible, to be closer and more loving with, with, with him. Um, the, uh, the wish that I have is that you're going to be able to pull, open up your Bible, if you've listened to this story of this lady that I'm going to tell you about, and read, read the Bible story, but also maybe uh, not only bless yourself, but gather together with some other people. Find a friend or a few friends and allow it to be a, a little Bible study. And start off with some prayer, uh, read the Bible, reflect on your own life. And then this is always important though when you, when you listen to these things and you hear me talk, make sure that whenever you do encounter the Bible, whenever you come across a person in the Bible, it isn't just, okay, I have read that story but you allow the story to touch your life, you relate it, but then there has to be an action thing that happens. God doesn't give us the Bible just as something that we read and we say, oh, well, it makes me feel good, or maybe I understand this, this person or that person. The real challenge of the Bible is that you and I are called to action, to do something. First of all, we're supposed to give ourselves more completely to God. But each of these people, they, they talk to us about how do we relate to the people in our lives? How can we be more God-like to these people? Well, come with me, with me now to the, the story of a, a person that might shock you. You might be very shocked when I tell you the story of this, this woman by the name of um, Yaoel. Um, listen, listen to her story, and first of all, catch your breath, <laughs> and then after you hear that, find how this story can be able to empower you to be the Christian that you're called to be today. Yo, Yoel is a wife who finds herself caught up in war. The war is happening up in the northern part of what we call Israel. Uh, on another program, we've talked about a wonderful leader of the people by the name of Deborah. She was the military leader of the Jewish people. You know? And she had a, another general by the name of Barak. And they had met the enemy. And she, Deborah was very clever. She, she maneuvered the en enemy into a position where they were very vulnerable, and the Jews were able to, boom, you know, to, to just decimate them. Um, Our Lady today was, was not a soldier like Deborah. Um, like all people, she was a person who wanted to live in peace rather than war, and she wanted to stay away from all kinds of injustice. Um, ya Yoel's tribe was nomadic, um, and they specialized in dealing with metal. They were small enough and resourceful enough 
to move where business was good and where there was security against violence and war. I can imagine that they were many times when they heard a battle was coming with their use of metals would kind of get near to the battle and be able to supply the spears and the arrows that people needed in the war of that time. Yeah. And when they were and, and they were when they were asked to supply these needs, they did it. They did it in a very happy way. But they tried as best they could not to have their men to join in the in the fighting. You know? They they tried to have this is it's fascinating because we hear about it all of times today. They tried to have diplomatic relations with with both the Jewish tribes as well as the enemies of the Jews who were the, the Canaanites, the people who lived in the land when the Jews came in. You know? As a businesswoman, uh, Yael um, was, was doing her part to help with the metal business, as well as being a wife and a mother. You know? Her life was full of ordinary activities. I can imagine she would have to try to build the kilns where they would, they would prepare the, the metal things. She'd have to take care of her children, making sure they had clothes, making sure they had education, doing all the things that a mother would do. Now here's an interesting thought too. Now, we're talking about war. Now, a lot of times when we think of war, we think of the army of the United States, the army of Japan, the army of, of Germany, and we think of a whole bunch of people all together and, you know, going off and going to war. But what we find in the Bible was that it wasn't such a big organized reality. Oftentimes when an army would come together, it took a leader to go to various tribes and try to convince them to join with them. So when we talk about the Jewish army, we're really talking about a, a group of people who were uh, from various different tribes coming together trying to overcome an enemy. And so to form this large army, uh, they, they had, an, had a, a tough time of trying to come up with enough to be able to overcome the, uh, the enemy. Yeah. A leader had to call individually. He had to be a charismatic person and try to be able to do that kind of thing. Uh, Yoel's tribe uh, didn't join Deborah's army. Uh, and, and, but now, when the defeated leader of the army, fighting Deborah, was fleeing, he thought he had a level of safety with an ally in, in uh, Yahweh's tribe. And this was going to be safe because these were kind of like neutral people. Let me, let me tell you the story. Uh, suddenly, the general of the Canaanite army the one that's just been defeated by Deborah, comes stumbling in to Yahweh's tent. Just try to think about this. Okay, she's just kind of working. Her world is, is just preoccupied with this. She's heard of the war going on in another place, but, oh, you know, she's just gonna, kind of doing her... And all of a sudden, this man comes stumbling into her tent, and she can tell by the way he's dressed that he's royalty, that he's very significant. And she knew in instantly that she was faced with a major decision. She was suddenly thrust out of the ordinary into the extraordinary. Uh, a, panic a panicking soldier could easily kill her. Uh, she was smart enough not to panic. She needed to take control of a volatile situation. Fortunately, the general was exhausted. His army had experienced an overwhelming defeat, and he had been running for hours from the Jewish soldiers, hungry to capture him and, and to execute him. With, with, with all his running, he was completely dehydrated. Yahweh had recently milked one of the goats and offered, offered a drink to the general. He gulped it down. And then, since her tribe had somewhat of an alliance with his tribe, he asked her if she would hide him from the Jews. Well, she agrees. Well, what else could she do? 
she could hide him underneath one of the carpets that covered the floor of the tent where she lived. Oh, he thanked her. And, and, and he said, when I get back into power again, you know, this man that's all convinced of his power, he promised that I, I'll remember you and I'll reward you with many kindnesses. And exhausted and full of, full of milk, he, he slides under the rug and soon he's fast asleep. Well, Jao weighed her, weighed her options. If she was to protect him and lie to the Jewish soldiers when they came looking for him, when they learned of her deceit, they'd probably return and punish her and her tribe and probably get killed. On the other hand, the Canaanite general uh, no longer had an army. Although her tribe strove to remain politically neutral, she knew that she was a Jew and God was on the side of the Jews. Her way became clear. She went outside and picked up one of the sharp metal uh, spikes her tribe had made in the kiln that day and had cons the, the kiln that she had instructed. She entered the tent and knelt down next to the head of the general. She nudged his shoulder to see how asleep he was. He didn't stir. She placed the end of the spike against his temple. She quickly prayed for God's strength. And with three strong strikes, she drove the spike through his head. <laughs> his eyes opened in shock. His body thrashed about helplessly for probably 10 seconds, and then he was still. The carpet she had spent so many long hours weaving was ruined by the gushing blood. She had never killed a man before. The cold, haunting reality seeped into her being. The next thing she knew, she heard shouts and, and commotion outside. The Jewish general had come looking for the enemy general. She stirred from her, from staring at, at the victim. She had fallen into somewhat of a stupor. She threw back the, the flap of her tent and Stood, stood still. She was covered with blood. <laughs> she called out, Come, I will show you the man you're looking for. So the general went in with her, and there was Sisera, dead, with the tent peg through his temple. Thank you so very much for your prayers and your financial support of this ministry. You are vitally important. Now, we've got an organization called The Mighty 800. We're looking for 800 people who every month will support us with a really powerful donation to allow us to continue. Problem is, we only have 677 of these people that are helping us. We need another 123. Would you think about joining the Mighty 800? Remember, the purpose is we get a program that goes across the country every week, sharing the love of God and the power of what God can do in everyone's life. This program is seen on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, it's seen on the Church Channel, and even on the American Forces Network, plus many cable networks. In addition to that, we have a daily reflection for your smartphone. It's called I God Today. Oh, this, this message is going to 70 countries around the world. But in addition to that, we have to be involved with this internet. We have to maintain our web page. We also have to be very active in social media. You know that. It's called Twitter and it's called Facebook. When you join and make your first payment, I'll send you a free copy of my book, 15 Faces of God. 
This is the story of how Jesus tells us who his Father is through the parables of Jesus. And if you're already a mighty 800 number, and when you invite someone else to join the mighty 800, we'll send you and your friend a copy of 15 Faces of God. Please, our need is urgent. We need help. Please, call the number on the screen or reach us by email. And God bless you for your generous help. Now the real challenge comes to us of this story. How do we relate that to our life? Well, take these thoughts. The first is the inescapable violence around us. Fortunately, most of us don't find ourselves in Yawel's situation. Here we have a serious enemy who has been defeated, fleeing for his life, and hoping he'll not be harmed among a tribe with whom uh, he was at peace, and also hoping this woman would be merciful. The violence of Yahweh is in line with many biblical stories that speak of not taking prisoners. The reason for the total violence and killing was a way of attempting to build a reputation of terror so that the other tribes would not try to mess with them. The slaughter of men, women, and children was an attempt at self-defense. This intimidation, intimidation is the basis of the arms buildup we find in many nations even today. There's the same fear of enemies trying to conquer. All too often when armies have built up large armaments for self-defense, these weapons are used offensively against threatening enemies. As followers of Jesus, we are called to a new understanding of peace and violence. As Christians, we're called to have peace in our own hearts. We respond to the call of conscience, which is, which, which is formed to love others as we love ourselves. Our enemies are not to be destroyed, but to be loved. Wow! <laughs> we are called to do good and pray for those who persecute us. This means that before we go to war, we inspect every effort to know and to appreciate our enemies. One of the basic reasons for going to war is to seek justice where injustice has been perpetrated. As a Christian, we need to understand the injustice and strive to rectify the injustice rather than ignore it through vengeful violence. Given the Christian orientation towards our enemies, is there ever a justification for war? Hmm. The, the Catholic Catechism explains the conditions for a just war. In this regard, let's, let's look at some of these conditions. And you and I both know we live in a world in which war is a reality. And what would be the situations in which we might say, ah, I guess there is a justification for that war? Here, here's, the, here's the points that are made. Number one, before we go to war, the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain. We can't just go into war for a, an incident that might have been a fla 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 flashing off of something that really wasn't significant, even though there might have been death. There has to be something very, very strong and grave and certain about the, the injustice that's happened. Number two, um, all other means of putting an end to it must have been used and exhausted. Every effort must be made to have peace and not war. Well, that's the second thing. We go to any extreme we can have. Well, another, another practical thing they give, number three, is there must be a, a serious prospect of success. You don't go into a war even though there's a great injustice and 
deep in your mind knowing that you're probably not going to be able to succeed. And, and, and in the fourth place, this is really important. The use of arms, the use of bombs, must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. The power of modern means of destruction weighs very heavily in evaluating this condition. The responsibility for determining whether these conditions are met belongs to the prudent judgments of those who have responsibility for the common good. The church cautions combatants that not everything is listed in war also. Actions which are forbidden and which are, constitute morally unlawful orders are things like, well, a, a, attacks against and mistreatment of non-combatants. Uh, in, in a war, it is never permitted to allow the death or the harming of those that are not the warriors. Also, there must be great care taken for wounded soldiers, both those that are part of your army and those of the part of the army that you are, you are, taking, that you are going against. And this care must also be given towards prisoners. Prisoners must be held with dignity and honor and goodness. The Catholic Church also highlights the terrible reality, and oh gosh, if only this were not something that we face today, the danger of genocide. We find one tribe or one group or one religion wanting to completely eliminate the other, men, women, and children without any sense of justice. You know? That may not happen as a people, as a nation, as an ethnic group, or a religious group. Given the modern means of warfare, especially uh, nuclear bombs, biological weapons, chemicals, these crimes against humanity must be especially guarded against. We always remember this. Here, here's some of the bottom line. Physical violence is not a Christian response to a problem. <laughs> we see the violence in fistfights among young people, drive-by shootings, suicide bombers, you know, mass murders in schools, offices, and theaters, and bombings and shootings in wars. We must not allow that to be the major response. We as Christians must fight as best we can to make sure we put away that violence and make sure that negotiations and honor and respect are the real directions that we work for. Well, we must admit that there is a place for just war. I mean, if, if there's, a, there's an army attacking us and they're killing us individually, we have the right to defend ourselves. That's, that's, that, that's very clear. It's important that if in a city we have people who are doing unjust things, we put them in jails, you know. But the overriding reality, and this is the challenge of what it means to be a Christian, the words of Jesus are real. We must love our enemies and do good to those who persecute us. We forestall violence by getting to know and to love people. And we move away from prejudice toward true love. Lord, help me, help me in our world of war and violence to have your answer, to have your understanding. And may the force of love be more powerful than the force of hate. We have a dream. We want to produce a very important program for which we need your special help. We want to tell the stories of our brave military personnel, people you know or knew. You can be part of this program by sending us the story of your loved one. We'll combine all the stories into a beautiful television program to air across the world. Be sure to send photos, please. 
consider a financial gift to enable us to produce this inspiring program, acknowledging our military. That means your loved ones. Please contact us with your story and donation. Call the number on the screen or write to us. Please, the need is urgent. Do it right now. Allow this miracle and this dream to happen. I hope that what I've shared with you about this, this fascinating lady in the Hebrew bio, Bible, Yahweh, um, is going to be able to perhaps shock you, but also challenge you to the importance of understanding how the Bible is something for us today. And uh, now, as I encourage you to study and perhaps wrestle with the Bible, let me throw out some questions that maybe would be helpful for you. Should abuse be allowed rather than breaking up a family? Well, a wife is being verbally or physically abused. Is it better to stay together, to have the unity of the family, or to break up? Another one is, is there a place for violence in the face of injustice? How, do we, how would you respond to that? And, and what are some of the... <laughs> here's an interesting thing, because uh, Yahweh was this. What are some of the social responsibilities of a housewife? And here's the next one, where we're dealing with her killing this general. Is the death penalty uh, all right in some cases? Well, I hope that as I throw these out to you, you'll think of that. Please, make sure you stay in touch. Uh, we want to know if you have some special prayer intentions for which we could pray. Uh, maybe there's a question that you have and you want to discuss that. We're here for you and we, we would like to support you. Um, also, uh, remember we have a thing called I God Today. It's a daily reflection, uh, a meditation on the daily readings of the Bible. Go on your, your iPhone, your, self, your, your, uh, your Android or your Windows telephones or even on your computer, you can go to our webpage, wordnet.tv, and catch up on the, uh, that. But again, thank you for writing. Thanks very much to Judy, and thank you very much to Mary Ann. Lord, bless these people. Bring your healing, your wholeness. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. And may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.